the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary, covering monetary, economic, and geopolitical news events. Now here are Kevin Oreck and David McIlvaney. Welcome to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck along with David McIlvaney. And David, today, before your guest joins you, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about the integration in Europe. You know, we're hearing all the chaos with Greece and it not being able to make its payments and, of course, you know, what kind of division that may be causing in Europe. But there are other opinions inside of Europe that are seeing this as just a progression, a natural progression towards more integration. Are you finding that? Yeah, Kevin, I think when you travel overseas, one of the things that you have to realize is that there's a lot more that you don't understand than that you do, whether it's linguistic differences cultural complexities, there's things that on the surface you can make a judgment of, but in fact you may be making a prejudiced judgment or a simply inaccurate judgment. It's important in that context, Kevin, to look at international issues from various perspectives and try to step into the shoes of someone who is there on the ground simply looking at things from a quote-unquote domestic perspective, although for us it would be an international one. Well, David, we've been looking at what's happening right now in Europe, but I think the bigger question probably would be to look a little further down the horizon and what will come out of this, uh, you know, in the next two, three, four, five years. Kevin, I think one of the things that I appreciate about our guest today is that when he's looking at politics, when he's looking at economics and finance, you will find that their whole work is one of anticipation and it is one of looking ahead. Kevin, let me just borrow a quote from our guest today, Frank Biancheri. Forces of inertia require anticipation. We need to look at the way we operate in the international realm, Kevin, and realize that under the current leadership, there is more of a series of reactions. An event occurs, and we have a reaction to it. We have a response to it. But there's very little anticipation. There's very little strategic thinking that uh, appears to be done in Washington, D.C. today. And I think you'll find that perhaps there is more anticipation in other parts of the world, whether it is conversations, Kevin, that we've had about the Chinese mindset in their five-year plans and thinking in terms of a strategic five-year plan. And certainly those five-year plans fit into a longer context of 50- and 100-year thinking. Kevin, I think this is something that's sorely lacking here in the United States and may, in fact, relegate us to the dustbins of irrelevance. Historically speaking, as you move forward 15, 20, 30, 40 years, our greatest weakness is that we are not forward-thinking. We're living, quote-unquote, in the moment. Again, as Frank likes to say, forces of inertia require anticipation. Certainly that complements what we do uh, with investors, trying to anticipate, trying to see what lies ahead so that the savage adjustments which you can encounter in the context of crisis are not a negative, but are either neutral or positive, being on the right side of a trend, Kevin. Well, David, I know you've been following the writings of Frank B. and Carey for quite a while and appreciate, even if you don't necessarily agree with each point, this anticipation that you're talking about. This is a forward look. You've talked to Otmar Issing, the same type of thing. Uh, you know, talking to Otmar Issing, he had a lot at stake for this European Union to work, but he also looked far enough ahead to say that crisis would probably bring about tighter integration. In retrospect, Kevin, I think we'll look at this period of 2012 to 2014 as either a window of opportunity or a period where we moved into utter tragedy, not only here in the United States, but internationally. Frank, thank you for joining us. There's many things that we want to discuss with you today. And I'll just start with my initial exposure to the group that you are a part of, the the LEAP 2020 group there in Europe. And it was with a report that you did on the precious metals market. And correct me if I'm wrong, but was that in 2006? Yes and quite an extensive report looking forward, as you often do, and anticipating changes in the metals market, changing popular response to things that are happening politically and financially. And you've written more recently that a crisis contracts time. Change that would ordinarily take decades or centuries can occur in months or years, and perhaps that's where we could begin today with the high points of change that you see over the next five to ten years. 
Yes, indeed. The crisis is exactly having this kind of effect. It's a contraction of time, which makes that changes that people are thinking could take a very, very long can happen in a matter of months or years. And right now, what we can see and we can anticipate for the, the coming years, I think, is pretty clear. We are going to see in the coming two, three, four years, first of all, complete reshuffle of the monetary system, international monetary system. Whether it will be an orderly one or a disorderly one is something which will be decided by the leaders in the coming two or three years. But one thing is certain in our opinion is that by 2015 at last, or 14 even, the way the international monetary system has been shaped since 1945, and especially since 1971, so based on the dollar only, is something which is going to vanish in the coming two to three years. One of the things that we've observed is that the French have always been particularly keen on noting change in the monetary systems. And I don't know why that is, but you know, looking at Jacques Roof and his advice given to de Gaulle, and even looking at how the U.S. $20 gold piece traded at significant premiums in Paris in 1931 and 32 in anticipation of nearly 65% depreciation or devaluation of the U.S. currency. There's been this anticipation. When you look at the monetary system today and say, okay, 2014, 2015, there will be a change that occurs, is that a view that the euro would play a larger role, that gold would play some role? Where do you see the significant changes happening, and is that something that the IMF plays a particularly large role in? Well, we think that the impulsion to the change, if it is a constructive one, will come from the G20. The IMF, for instance, will just be a tool if it is used at all. But it will come from the G20 because the pressure will come significantly and at the same time both from Europe, current situation between the euro and the dollar, or I would say Wall Street and the city on one hand and the euro land or eurozone on the other hand is getting more and more tense and more and more volatile and will lead to, I think, some confrontations uh, pretty directly next year between the leaders of both UK and US and the eurozone on the other side. And secondly, it will come from the BRICS country. Russia, China, India, Brazil are not going to tolerate more than the next two, three years maximum to have a monetary system where they play a bigger and bigger role and have almost nothing to say. So essentially what we are going to see is if it's orderly, probably through or with the IMF transformation of the SDR into something which will be a kind of new global currency probably based upon a basket of the major ones like dollar, euro, yuan, yen, real, the major currencies we can imagine now, and certainly some part of gold inside, because gold is making its big comeback from supposed to be an old-fashioned antique obsolete means to something much more modern than people thought 40 or 50 years ago. And uh, that will be another only one. If it's managed through the G20 using the IMF and the existing system to transform it by 2014-15 into something stable where the U.S. dollar will just be one among others inside this basket of currencies. So the potential for an orderly change directed by the G20, I assume that your view is that the G20 will take on a larger role over the next year or so because many of its leaders will be replaced this absolutely, next year. Absolutely, absolutely. We think that the next G20 in Cannes will bring nothing on the table because it's still made of leaders which are at the end of the terms. But from next year on, from 2012 on, onwards, there will be significant change. I would say that most of the major countries within the, the G20 are going to have new leaders by the end of 2012. And that is going to provide a new impetus and probably as far as we can see with our contacts with G20 diplomats and G20 advisors for the summit, we can see that there is an increasing demand for some action and ideas are starting to be there about what to do and how to implement these changes. But this is not something which can be taken for certain, of course. And there is another option. The disor uh, perhaps the disorderly. Uh, disorderly, ab yes. absolutely. And this disorderly thing will generate for several years a complete chaos where gold definitely will be the big winner because it will affect all the paper currencies will be in dire situation. And this will trigger a complete currency war for at least four, five, six years before the system finds a new way to settle down and to reconstruct some systems. But we are, for the next two years, that will be the decisive time, whether it will be disorderly or orderly. But in any case, the system, as we know it, cannot go, in our opinion, beyond the next two, three years.
We could take a 100-year view to the changes that are taking place currently. Now, you've shrunk down this decade, the 2010 to 2020 decade, is what you call the linchpin decade. And I've said basically this is of a critical nature, perhaps the most important decade in the next 50 to 100 years. And then you've shrunk it down even further to say that this next few years, this period of 2010 to 2014, which is now immediately in front of us, just a few years left of that, represents the end of the world before what you just referenced as the post-1945 world order with the U.S. dollar and Washington, D.C. and New York being the primary determinants of growth and success and reference, if you will. And then the last half of the decade, 2015 to 2020, the emergence of the world after. Help us understand what that looks like. We would assume ascendancy and further progress in China and India and Asia generally. Perhaps in the U.S. there's some speculation that you may, not so many would assume a rebirth of European primacy. Can you look at the important supportive factors for such an outcome where Europe plays a more dominant role? Is it tied to the euro? Is it tied to greater integration of a fiscal and political nature? Yeah, in my book, as you know, time, which I think is really crucial, is this period between 2012 and 2016. So we are now getting to the four years which are crucial. In these four years, if we are in the positive scenario, which makes us the orderly process and not the disorderly one, of course we are going to see the increasing power and influence of China, of Brazil, of Russia, and India, and so on. That's something which uh, I think nobody can uh, even argue with right now. But as you mentioned, Europe, we are witnessing already something which the markets are seeing every day and they cannot identify. Europe, for the worst or for the best, has become central within the crisis right now at this stage. Everybody is looking at what's happening in Europe since now 18 months with the Greek crisis, the Euro crisis, whatever people call it. But one thing has become clear. What happens right now within the Eurozone or the Euroland, as I call it, has become the most influential factor affecting uh, world stock exchanges and financial markets, which, in fact, is not only a sign that there are troubles in Europe, it's also a sign that what happens in Europe now matters immediately for the rest of the world. And I think that it is right now in a transition process, but it is a long-lasting trend that the crisis is provocating and accelerating a new phase of integration within Europe and uh, around the countries sharing the euro currency. We are seeing in the last 18 months, we have been seeing an amazing speed of integration with the creation of the financial stability uh, fund, with a lot of new regulations for integration, the move now to fiscal integration, and so on. So we are seeing a real rebirth, kind of renaissance of the integration process, which was stopped for about 20 years. And this is creating, at the core of the European continent, a new group of countries which are basically a new sovereign which is emerging. And this new sovereign emerging will be in the next two, three years, uh, will be almost completed. And that will create definitely a new player which is crucial. Why is it crucial? Because it's in many ways at the center of the possible new world order which can come out of this crisis, le monde d'après, the world after the crisis. Uh, Why? Because Europe is able to talk and to discuss and to find common grounds with the U.S. and also with the BRICS countries. So in fact, it's a power broker. If Euroland uh, and the Europeans move one direction, they can make the majorities of any of the international institutions, either with the BRICS or with the U.S. For instance, for the U.S., it's something which is almost impossible to make a partnership and common proposals for the new structure of the world with the BRICS countries, because there are so many issues where the U.S. is at odds with Russia, India, China, and so on, that it is a no-go in that direction. Well, Europe is able to make agreements or to find common solutions with both sides. And that is exactly in a new world situation where nobody is going to be the leading country, but on the contrary, it will be a mix of powers which are somehow somewhere about the same size or similar influences. The main influential power is the one who can create majorities. And I think that Europe is exactly heading directly towards this situation, this position. A question of leadership, because you make the point about leadership, which is if you do aspire to the role to be right, you have to take the risk of being wrong. 
And it would appear, at least from the outsider's perspective, that the present leadership within Europe is more, and again, this is the perspective on Brussels specifically, not particularly leadership on a country-by-country basis, but the Brussels leadership is not particularly productive. That's the least you can say. I mean, first of all, Brussels is not in the game anymore. What is happening is that it's a Euroland process. It's 17 countries sharing the euro, which are making the drive right now. Brussels is mostly a a spectator in many ways or a a side player. But as we titled in one of our bulletins in May 2010, when the stability fund was created, it was a coup d'etat made by the Eurozone countries within the EU. So in fact, one wants to understand what's going on right now in the European integration and for the future. One has to focus on what's happening within the Eurozone countries and not anymore within the EU institutional framework like Brussels, Strasbourg and so on. The second element is that the political level at the national level is also very weak right now within the EU and within Ireland, because all of these leaders also are at the end of their mandates. So what we have been anticipating and we are seeing very clearly coming in the next six, nine months to nine months, is there will be a renewal of leadership in most of the major Ireland countries, France, Spain, Italy, and Germany. Germany, uh, the coalition will never last till 2013. They will have elections next year as well. So the Euroland countries are going to see next year, by the end of 2012, a complete renewal of leadership. And it's a very similar and, and parallel process to the G20, where you have also uh, these countries, plus Russia, plus the US, plus uh, China, where the renewal will take place. It's a strange coincidence, but 2012, both in Europe and on the global scene, is having this kind of transition of power. It will be a new generation of leaders and leaders within Europe, which for the first time will be leaders who have seen the crisis taking place and for the last 18 months to two years have been witnessing the lack of ambition and the lack of leadership that the current leader has been showing. If I can take an example, an image, uh, I don't know if, if you are familiar with what was called the Euro missile crisis at the early 80s. Euro- when Euro missile crisis, it was the Russians, the Russians tried, the USSR tried to neutralize Europe with a system of missiles, and NATO tried to make, put counter missiles, and for a while Europe seemed to be completely lost because it was full of pacifist movements, preferring to be red than dead and so on. And at this time, in 1981, it looks like the European project was completely failing. And three years later, with a new group of leaders arriving in 82, 83, Mitterrand, Kohl, and so on, it was only three years after that there was the first, what I call the first renaissance of the European project, which leads to the single market, the single currency, Erasmus, and all that kind of thing. So Europe is used to that kind of situation where at one point it looks like the leadership is completely gone and the project is going completely in a no specific direction or even going to collapse. And in fact, just two, three years later, the change of leadership and the leads, in fact, to rebirth of the process. And I think we are exactly on the same pattern and that if we make the interview again uh, in the second semester of 2012, it will be a completely different vision of what Europe is doing and what your Roland is heading for. Just a reminder, you're listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y dot com. Yeah, it seems that you know, we are getting to that point where there is either greater integration and success as they move forward towards that vision of a unified Europe Or, and then this is perhaps where we have um, some questions remaining, you you see throughout Germany voters continuing to send a particular message. Merkel's coalition is losing ground. Uh, It seems that the efforts to bail out various European countries is not popularly, quote-unquote, or democratically acceptable. How do we then see different form of leadership, whether it's France, Spain, Italy, Germany, which takes us in the direction of integration rather than a fracturing of European interests towards more national or local concerns? Well, I must say that I disagree with this uh, feeling uh, or this analysis. I think the Anglo-Saxon media have been completely twisting what's happening in Europe, essentially because well, a lot of media in the U.S. or in U.K. don't understand what the EU is doing. I mean, when you take U.K. news about Europe, it's like if you were taking, I don't know, USSR news about America during the Cold War. The problem, so, yeah. yeah it's a, so let's be clear. There is no specific popular movement in Europe, in Germany or anywhere else right now, 
which is against the integration. It's just a typical, classical 15% uh, of voters which have been eurosceptic forever, and uh, this number will stay forever, and so on. The crisis just gives them some more vocal situation, and media are making a big emphasis on what they are saying. But when you look at the political situation on terms of, of majorities and political parties, you have seen the overwhelming majority in the Bundestag which has supported the extension of the Financial Stability Fund. I mean, if there is a new leadership next year in Germany, the SPD Green, probably, uh, who could be the alternative to the CDU right now, is even more in favor of European integration than the CDU FDP current coalition. If you take France, the Socialist Party is most likely going to win the next presidential election. They are even more in favor of European integration acceleration than Sarkozy's the UMP right now. So when you look at the situation, politically speaking, in the Eurozone countries, not only are the existing parties in power in favor of this integration, but the opposition parties are most of the time even more in favor of it. So very honestly, coming from Europe, uh, working and following these issues for more than 25 years now at different levels, I cannot see... I have a strong imagination, but I cannot imagine one single possibility right now that there is any other way than this fastening of integration taking place next year, as I was saying before. It's not the wishful thinking, it's just a fact of life and a fact of political situation and the strength of those trends uh, in each of the country. The pro-integration parties are in power and will stay in power, whatever happens in the coming years. So in that sense, the story is already written down. The only thing which is questioning the process is a democratic issue. And that's not dating from this crisis. It's a very old issue of the democratic deficit and so on in, within the EU and uh, since at least 20, 25 years. But this democratic question is also something which is changing with the Euro uh, integration, is the fact that what we think, and uh, that in the next two years, by 2014, the Euroland countries are going to be obliged to present a new constitutional treaty to the population. But the population of the Euroland, not of the EU, so only the countries sharing the euro. And this referendum, for the first time, will be a trans-European referendum, not a series of national referendums like they did last time, and it was a complete failure and, and a mess. So, in fact, not only we think that this is the next two, three years are going to see more European integration within the Euroland and, and the emerging of a semi-state within the Euroland, but it will also trigger, by force, the first democratic process involving public opinions to support this integration. And I have no doubt that in such a trans-European referendum, there will be an overwhelming majority in favor of these steps. The Eurosceptic forces on the continent within the Eurozone are absolutely marginal. They are vocal right now because the politicians are unable to present a long-term future and a perspective. This shortcoming will be disappearing next year with a new bunch of, the, of leaders taking, play, taking position in France, in Spain, in Germany, and so on. And I assure you, my job with the LEAP is to be as objective as we can. But I will not say negative thing I don't think about Europe just because for the sake of looking objective, I think I am objectively describing a situation like we have done with our work for the past five, five years and a half, because it is exactly what we are seeing when we look at public opinions, political trends and so on taking place within the Euroland. Well, certainly looking at the Anglo-Saxon media bias, and we would agree, whatever the media we're talking about, there is a bias always. There always are reasons to be expressing opinions in the way that they are expressed. We've gotten a free pass. London has gotten a free pass, and New York and D.C. has largely gotten a free pass with a focus on the euro crisis, with a focus on Greece. It's diverted a tremendous amount of attention from oh, cool. yeah. Anglosphere deterioration and what could be very well a collapse in the U.S. currency and a collapse in the U.S. Treasury market. If people were looking not just at liquidity concerns, but uh, real balance sheet issues here in the United States. Mm, One thing that seems to be troubling to me with the ECB, Trichet is moving on. Mario Draghi takes his place. Does this help or hurt the ECB? Is this almost a replay? Maybe we're adding too much from one portion of his CV, his stint with Goldman Sachs. How much does he play to London and New York interests as opposed to the interests of Europe? Yeah, that's a big question. I think that it has been a very bad move 
at least in, in terms of public opinion relation, public relations with public opinion in Europe, to put a former Goldman Sachs manager as the ECB, uh, at the head of the ECB. I think it's a mistake in terms of credibility of the ECB toward the European public opinion. But then we have to leave Draghi at least the benefit of the doubt for the first six months to see whether he will act as a European dedicated bureaucrat or if he will act as a former uh, Goldman Sachs uh, employee. I think that the constraints of his job will be anyhow extremely big, so he will not have that big room of, for maneuver on his own interest. But I think that the ECB is, is getting to a position which now cannot go beyond alone. That's one of the jobs that the governments have to do within the Euroland in the coming six months, and I think they are aware and that they are going to move uh, next year at least on that, that there is a need for having political, economical governance balance to the ECB. And meanwhile, we have to have the governments taking responsibilities with euro bonds and so on of many issues which now are left only to the ECB to solve. And uh, I think the ECB has done most of its job, and now the governments have to go to some, for something else with more integration and more balance of power between the ECB and the political level. That's why I think 2012 will also bring a lot of innovations like these eurobonds, whatever the German public opinion is saying right now, eurobonds will be part of 2012. And that will diminish a lot the pressure on the ECB and as well the feeling that they are the only ones able to do things, which is in fact true right now. And again, for Draghi, I think that is a bad public opinion move and a real threat, I would say, for the common public good of Europe because he's coming from Goldman Sachs. But I will wait for six months to be sure of that. Well, it looks like 2011, the last quarter, and 2012 are shaving up to be very, very interesting and perhaps incredibly volatile. One of the things that we've looked at, and again, going back to my original introduction to your work, which was a special report on gold, gold has made a comeback in the last few years. It's done very well, and it is something that does well during periods of distress. It's something like an insurance policy. It pays during a particular period in time. Seeing it play an official role in the international monetary system, I'm having a challenge with this on the one hand, particularly just coming back from Europe, because un amongst the banking community, gold is very unpopular. How does it play that role among central bankers? This is what's been considered the barbaric relic. What is their newfound motivation to have something that is an anchor or ties their hands, so to say? Well, gold may be unpopular with bankers, but I will say that bankers are even more unpopular with everybody right now. So what I think is indicating where things are going to go in the coming, in the coming years. The only way gold was suppressed or put out of any role in this monetary system was due to the fact that the dollar was able to have the credibility enough to play the role of the anchor. Now this role is finished. So you take uh, the dollar out as the anchor and you have to have some for, yeah, sort of an anchor. Exactly. I mean, the credibility for the dollar, I mean, if you look at the gold, as we explained in our last bulletin with Leap, is that if we look at the next three years, the only way gold prices could go down will be either the dollar finds the new credibility again as the sole reserve currency and so on. Well, to be honest, uh, low probability. Yeah, even zero probability, I think, in terms of, uh, of this happening. Or that the G20 finds a way to create a new global currency, maybe with some gold inside, by the way, but a new global currency to be the new basis for the monetary system. But in the best scenario for that, it will never happen in the next three years. So what we say that for the next three years, we don't see how gold can go anywhere but up, because these are the two only conditions for gold to go down, and they will not be met, neither one, neither the other, before at least 2014-15. Mm -hmm. So that gives three years at least, where we think the trend is clear and central bankers are just obliged, like everybody else, they are submitted to this reality. One of their jobs is to be sure that they are able to preserve the value of the reserve of the country. And therefore, as we have seen in the past two years, most central banks in the world are now uh, becoming buyers of gold when they've been selling it for decades. And this is such a simple fact that they have no option, no other option. Well, if for other reasons, we've looked at sort of the 2014 to 2016 period as a major transition point, and up to that point is an incredibly lucrative for someone who owns gold. The, the good news comes with bad news. Most people do not have 100% of their assets in the precious metals. 
So where you see a gain on the one side, you're likely to see losses on the other, whether that's equities or dollar-based assets. Of course. Perhaps you have some thoughts on the Treasury market and the fact that here recently, yet again, there's a move to dollars and specifically to Treasuries when there's concern with the euro, when there's concern with the eurozone, when there's concern generally with liquidity. What do you think changes people's perspective on the validity of Treasuries as an instrument of stability? Well, I think that the trend we've been seeing recently is is not... The fact that there are troubles in Europe, and therefore people will move towards the treasuries, that there will have been a creation of a supposed to be a deadly crisis in the eurozone in order to have people moving and shifting to treasury bonds. We are in a situation, basically, where the Western world is trying to find funds by any means, in a world where these funds are less and less available. And therefore, the past quarters have been showing that, well, say, Wall Street or the U.S. have been more and more trying to push fear on Europe in order to convince uh, international buyers to come to T-bonds rather than going to Eurozone bonds and so on. Nevertheless, it doesn't necessarily work so well, uh, at least when you look at Asia and so on. But going back to the uh, treasury bonds market, I believe that by the end of this year, November and December, we are going to see another replay of this summer budgetary selling and so on situation in the U.S., that there will be a new degradation of the ratings because there will be no solution found in Washington. And that what I think is already the recession taking place in this country will show that there is absolutely no way out of a new long recession and painful one. We see that public opinions just look at the Occupy Wall Street movement, which is now starting to make the headlines everywhere. We see that public opinion within the U.S. In less, is less and less ready to accept the way policies are made right now uh, within this country. So to make it short, I think that by the end of this year, we are going to see that the U.S. is Greece, and that, in fact, the true Greece is the U.S., and that will have a devastating effect on the T-bonds market. Yeah, now this is very clear, and coming back to an earlier point in our conversation, this is really a reflection of leadership. I've garnered from reading various things that you've published that you're not a particular fan of Sarkozy, or at least his leadership abilities, and I think we could say the same of our current administration, not to pick on even one personality, but to look at the whole stock and legislature. To be right, as you've said, and I'll quote you again, you have to take the risk of being wrong. Exactly. And we don't have people today who are concerned about doing the right thing for our country. They care more about their political legacies, I think, or that's at least what their inactivity at these critical moments is implying. So 2012 looks to be a very, very interesting year. I think it's really a a pivotal, I don't know if people say that in English, a year which is going to be, I think, in the history books, remember, the one year where, I hope for the better, extremely important changes will take place in the way the, the world is, is, is organized. Well, we we'll look forward to exploring some of those ideas with you over the next couple of days, and uh, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. If our listeners are interested, where might they find more information? I'll let you direct them, if you will, either to your website or... Uh... Yeah, there is my website, frankbiancheri.eu, or there is my book, uh, where they can find on the website of the publisher, which is anticipolis.eu. The book is... Uh, the world after the crisis. And of course, there is a LIB 2020 website where we have this bulletin and all this information on the crisis and its development every month, which is the leap2020.eu. We'll go ahead and include those links on our website and people can just click straight through. Okay. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. Well, you've been listening to the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. I'm Kevin Oreck, along with David McIlvaney and our guest today, Frank Biancari. You can find us at McIlvaney.com. That's M-C-A-L-V-A-N-Y.com. Or give us a call at 800-525-9556. This has been the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary. The views expressed should not be considered to be a solicitation or a recommendation for your investment portfolio. You should consult a professional financial advisor to assess your suitability for risk and investment. Join us again next week for a new edition of the McIlvaney Weekly Commentary.